British Orienteering is 50 years old. To celebrate, we're taking a look back at how it was when it all began. And we'll also be looking into the future to see what orienteering could look like in 50 years time. But first, here's Carol McNeil with how British Orienteering began 50 years ago today. Scotland and England decided to join because then they could enter a national team. So um, I went up to the British Championships in Hampsley Forest. That was the first British Championships. It was really good having people like Chris Brasher, who's a, a famous um, BBC journalist and wrote in The Observer, and he did quite a lot of articles selling orienteering. Uh, John Disley, um, international steeplechaser, he was uh, been in orienteering uh, like forever. But there was Gordon Peary running. Now that's a big name if you've got a, a chap who'd been a very successful Olympic uh, runner, world record holder. There'd be newsletters sent out by post, no computers then, um, and you decide to enter and enter it by post or enter on the day. But um, at the start um, you'd then have master maps where you had to copy your course from the right master map onto your map and there was lots of skill attached to this. And you, and you wanted to be off before the next person on the next minute was coming. Well, in, in many cases you couldn't possibly, or it was very, very difficult to copy the things accurately down. Maps have changed beyond recognition. The mapping was very simple. You simply went out and bought a two and a half inch uh, m map and then you were going to get a black and white photocopy of that. We'd used a big depression in an area but it wasn't marked on the map but where it was you just drew the circle on the, the master map and um, that was it. It was sort of doctored up and Sometimes they'd enlarge it and put a new scale on, and, and it was a sort of work of art. 76, when the World Championships were in Scotland, um, Sue and Robin Harvey mapped for that World Championships, and then their expertise in map, you know, developed in mapping, and um, so then mapping really took off again in the mid 70s. I can imagine that mapping will change in similar ways that it has in the past sort of 40 or 50 years and that's how much data is available to the, the cartographer, the surveyor. Uh, if we look at uh, urban mapping nowadays, um, we've got uh, Google, Street View, uh, lots of sort of ordnance survey data, LiDAR data, uh, and you can gather so much data to make a map, you can almost produce a, a pretty good map without ever going out into the field. And I can see that changing uh, into the forest environment. So you will be able to gather a lot of data without ever going into the field. And then with the uh, advent of drones and things like that, I think there's a good chance the surveyor may never leave their office. Clothing has advanced in line with fashion. Initially, when people start, they'd just wear almost any old clothes. Uh, you realise very quickly that it was advisable to run with studs so quite a lot of people would have started with football boots or hockey boots initially. It was very loose and it was nylon. You know, we picked up lots of tips from the Scandinavians. You know, we'd go over to Scandinavia in the summer and see what they were wearing um, and think, oh, that looks good, we'll get some of that. And it was all a bit baggy and people would get uh, make their own with pockets for their whistles and um, pen for the master maps. If we're looking at shoes in the past, you know, previously they were very uncomfortable because they tend to be very heavy, no support, there was stitching all over the places. But for the future, I think we're going to go into just a mixture of very lightweight, breathable fabric with lightweight mesh. Punching is now much easier. In Sweden, they, they were using these little stamps and they were like self-inking stamps. When you got a set, if you were organising an event, you press them down and it would have left, a, in theory, an indelible mark on, the, uh, on your card. And then that was the precursor of the pin punches. The pin punches, I mean, they lasted a long time and we still use them for some events. 
and then electronic punching was introduced about 20 years ago and now for the first time at JK everybody that 60% of participants are using new contactless cards and contactless punching is the future for orienteering. Paper results are out it's all electronic now. Um, they'd sort of put your name on the label and then stick it on a um, you know slip of wood which then all had hooks so that they could change the positions as people came in. At sort of big events you'd leave an envelope with your name and address on and um, then the art of the organiser or one of the skills that people used to like to do was to get the results um, photocopied and into the envelopes on the night of the event. It was a major job. Uh, <laughs> the formal results you wouldn't get for perhaps a week, sometimes two weeks or three weeks after the event. In terms of the future, maybe a little bit more effort will be going to GPS tracking to try and make that more accessible more events. The future is looking exciting. I think the future of British orienteering is being able to go on adapting to some things that we maybe realise are here now, but things probably we can't even dream about yet. I think orienteering has got a really strong future. Uh, I think our challenge is that we, have, we, we rely tremendously on volunteers. Without, without those volunteers there is no sport. We intend spending quite a lot of time developing our orienteers over the next four or eight years. I think one of the things that we will have is more variety. I think the busy lives a younger generation have at the moment mean that their every week orienteering, they don't want to travel too far, they've got too many other things going on. So we need local hotspots with lots of local orienteering. People just loved making it good for everybody. I mean, like they still do, you know, we just like making it into the best sport that we have. So there you have it, a little insight into what British orienteering has looked like over the past 50 years and a bit of a guess about what it might be doing in the future. Let's celebrate this 50th golden milestone and look forward to the next 50 years.